you know, so many women right now are like, I want to be a millionaire. That's it. <laughs> I know. I don't know what, like, why? <laughs> First of all, a million ain't nothing compared to <laughs> the inflation and everything going on. So we're going to aspire. I'm getting let's to get, the point. Let's get up. Let's- or I'm like, y'all fought this hard to work. <laughs> <laughs> but I also understand, like, if you have a nine to five and you're making 140 and you feel like you worked really hard to get to that 140 mm-hmm. and then inflation hits... Yeah. And then, you know, your AC unit goes out and, 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 and then you're like, hey, yeah, yeah. I'm just working just to pay everybody else. I can't even really like do anything. And and I'm joking when I say that, but I'm glad that we have the opportunity as women to build wealth now. I mean, just, just to be... Just recently, we were able to get our own bank accounts, 1960, right? Like, can you believe that? No. Um, But it's... There's so much more. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm just like, you have to prioritize your love life, yeah. your friendships, your family. I don't know what it is with me, but I feel like I'm going through this stage where I'm realizing what's more important more and more every day. It's the girl CEO show. Run it up. Always on the grind. You already know what's up. Everything from day to life in the business. Covering it all like a boss. Come and get this. It's the Girl CEO Show. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome to the Girl CEO Show, the playground for female entrepreneurs. I am Ronnie Brown, your host. And today I have with me the GOATs, <laughs> Morgan Devon. <laughs> Let the people know um, who you are and a little bit about yourself before we get started. My name is Morgan Devon. As you said, I am here in Nashville. We're shooting at my house. Yes, we are We are at Morgan's house. <laughs> um, and I'm the CEO of Blavity Inc., which is a corporation that builds product services and media for black audiences and people who love black culture at this point because they found out about us. So we're getting quite big. But we own Travel Noir, 2190. We have a new brand called Home and Texture. Um, Afrotech and talent infusion and just all the things dedicated to blackness. You know what I love? I love that when you come on, you you just keep it real cool and like humble, but you know I'm not about to let you. <laughs> so you just name like seven companies yeah. that so many people know mm-hmm. of, but many people are not aware that my good girlfriend has this portfolio that is killing it right now. Yeah. You guys, let me do a reintroduction. Um, this is the... Morgan Devon. And (laughs) one of the things that I love about you is your ability to navigate in business as a woman, dominate by companies, and you are building a portfolio that is on a whole nother level. We're having a lot of fun. You are cleaning the fuck up. (laughs) Yes. It's a down market, which is always a good time to buy things. Yes. (laughs) How did you get started on this journey? Mm. You know, I started Blavity um, nine years ago. I went to school in St. Louis. And then right when I graduated, went to Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And Silicon Valley, to me, is the ultimate playground. It was the ultimate playground. It's changed a lot since the pandemic. But pre-pandemic, ultimate playground, you know, you walk down the street and you see the headquarters for every major, major company in in the world. Like, you've got Salesforce, Twitter, Facebook, Microsoft. You've got, I worked at Intuit. All of their campuses either are in Mountain View or in downtown San Francisco or out. If they're older companies, they're in San Jose. But it's all within a radius of like you're walking down the street and you're just like bumping into people (laughs) making a million dollars off just code, you know. And it's just it was such an inspiring time for me and for my own mindset of what could be. And the part that really drove me to say, well, this isn't quite working out for us black folks, is that nobody was building products or using the same methodology or this mindset or the resources of Silicon Valley to build for black folks at the core audience member, as the core customer, as the core thing that you are building your platform for. And that was just a wide open space. There's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy. That was the blue ocean. It was like, if I can really 
understand and build and solve solutions, build solutions for our community and leverage the technology and the infrastructure of Silicon Valley, this should work. Yeah. This should work. How does an everyday Black woman break into Silicon Valley? I mean, it's definitely a bit of luck and a bit of (laughs) hard work and a lot of strategy, you know. Um, First things first was just getting out there and getting a job. And um, I just applied to companies whose products I use. A lot of products that we use every single day, there is someone responsible for hiring. (laughs) There is someone building the product, coding the product, marketing the product, doing HR at that company. Um, So a company that I was product I was using, I was using Mint.com and TurboTax, okay. which is owned by a company called Intuit. I had never heard of Intuit, but I went to their corporate website, went to their careers page and saw that they had a program for early career because I had just graduated or I hadn't graduated yet. So I applied for that program. So this is a cheat code, girl CEOs. That, that, was, a, <laughs> that, was, a, that was a little cheat code right there. So you were looking at products that you were using, and then you were like, let me go check these companies Who out. Who owns these companies? Yeah. So you are the LinkedIn queen. Well, LinkedIn didn't even exist. Okay, so back then it didn't exist. No. But now you, you know, we I'm call you the LinkedIn queen. Yeah. And I think that makes it just much easier for people who are trying to get into that that field and that world, it's like use LinkedIn yeah. to locate those people, see who, own, who owns these companies, yep. and use LinkedIn to pull up on these people. And not even just LinkedIn, because LinkedIn will still just, they'll give you the hierarchy. So that's the other thing. So on LinkedIn, you can also say, well, who's who's boss? What team do these report into? Who do these? You can Google organizational charts of these companies and see who reports to who. Okay. So who's making the decision at the end of the day? It's usually not the recruiter. Hmm. So when you're applying for jobs, the recruiter is only screening you. You just have to get past the recruiter to get to the to the business owner. They're hiring to fill a job to solve a business problem. There is a business leader that they are serving up a portfolio of like these are the candidates. Who is that person? Yeah. What are they? Who do they report to? What business do they report into? And then if you really want to be OCD, which I was, and I highly <laughs> recommend if it's that a, you are, yes, if it's a publicly <laughs> traded company, then go and look at their recent uh, investor reports. So every publicly traded company, every quarter, they report out on how much revenue they do, where they're earning, where they're losing. Um, they report on every business division. It's public information because they are a publicly traded company. You can buy stock in their company. And as an owner, you're entitled to know certain information. So you can literally see a company's strategy. You can get their entire investor shareholder presentation. You have the blueprint. It's my favorite pastime. Free game. <laughs> Free game. And, and one of the things that you have been so great at is making those connections and, mm-hmm. and doing those raises. How much did you raise the first time you, you started to raise money? My first fundraise was about $500,000, okay. which was everything. You know, that was like, oh, y'all done fucked up, gave me some money. <laughs> like, let's go. You know, so that was that was fantastic. Really hard to get your first money in. You know, it took me over a year. Um, and then from there... I was able to raise pretty much every 18 months after that for three years. So my total amount of raise is like a little under 12, a little under 13 million. Okay. Um, I don't raise anymore. I haven't raised since 2018 because I didn't want to be dependent on the venture capital industry for us to be able to grow our business. The venture Mm -hmm. capital industry really is not set up for every business. So let's talk about that because the girl CEOs out here are hearing so many companies raising millions and millions of dollars, $50 million raise, $100 million raise. And everyone now in the black community is beginning to say, should I raise money? Like, what does that look like? Can you talk to all of the people who are watching this about what that really looks like? Yeah. What does raising money really look like and what are your responsibilities after taking that money because everyone is saying get the money but sis nobody is talking about what happens after you get that money yeah who you're indebted to right and what happens if you don't fulfill the responsibilities that come with taking that income yeah that's right so when you raise money you are selling 
a piece of your company to a investor or a group of investors. And you're setting a price of how much your company is worth. And you're showing a presentation that says, if you give me this money, I'm going to use it to 3x, 10x, 4x the size of this company. Okay. So you're making a promise. You're making some sort of promise and a general plan. They're investing in you. Got it. For the most part. Uh, the money is going to the company, but they're really going to, at the early stage, they're investing in the person. Got it. That you're, you are the person who's going to be able to navigate the ups and the downs, the pandemics, so that I can get my money back and then some, mm-hmm. right? So so that's first things first. You're selling a piece of your company, which means you have to be comfortable with every time you fundraise, your ownership of the company is decreasing. Oh, it's let like the a pie. people know. Because <laughs> right? they don't tell you this part. Yeah. So if you're raising $10 million and you're valuing your company at $20 million, you're selling half. You're selling 50%. How does that affect your profit margin? <laughs> it doesn't, actually. So that's the that's the good thing about fundraising. You're not uh, taking the money in a way that is like a um, it's not like revenue exchange. It's just selling the asset of your company. And uh, that is the part that is the reason why people do it. Okay. So instead of taking a loan from a bank where you're paying interest, okay, where you are then cutting into your profit margin because you're paying off that interest in addition, mm-hmm. it's just like when you take out a loan for college, you have the loan for what it actually costs you and then the interest on top of it that you also have to pay back. Okay. So that would be a... Uh, you could do a fundraise like that. That's called a convertible note. A convertible note. Um, or a safe is another term for a different type of it, but it's a loan. Just think about it as a loan. That's the one thing about Silicon Valley. They're going to get you with these terms. So let's talk <laughs> about the term. So you are selling a portion of your company. Yes. And then they're giving you this money yes. for your brand or your business or whatever you have yes. going on. But there are also terms. So and many conditions. Terms. Yes, And no one is talking about the terms and conditions. So the terms and conditions may go as so. So you get a term sheet. So you get a term sheet from an investor who says, I like you. I would like, just like Shark Tank, I would like 50% of your business for $10 million. (laughs) Which sometimes is crazy, but go ahead. But that's what they'd be talking about. That is a term sheet. They're doing live term sheets on Shark Tank. And they're saying, I want... 10%, 10%, I want 50% of your business and I want a board seat. So if you don't have a board, you got to make a board. Mm-hmm. And then if you have a board, then I'm going to, I want, so you not only, you have to make a board, not, it's not optional. You take that kind of money, you make, you have a board. They sit on the board and then usually you can't just have two people on a board, not just you and the investor because you vote. Mm. So you need three because you need an odd number. So then you've got to get an independent board member. Okay. Which could be your co-founder. Okay. Could be an advisor who's been with you along the way. Could be another investor. So up for debate, but you might talk about that in your term sheet. And then it's going to tell you all the things that they get a say on in your term sheet. So this is where (laughs) this is where it gets tricky. This is where I feel like (laughs) we ain't reading the fine print. Okay. I'm like, you got to read the fine print. So then they can say things like, all right, uh, if you want to take out a loan, we have to get approval. If you want to give yourself a raise of a certain amount, we approve that. Okay. If they, my board sets my salary, they approve my annual budget, they approve um, the stock equity that we give to our employees. So every time a new employee comes on board, I can tell them what kind of equity they're going to get, but I have to get approval from the board to actually give it to them. Got it. Because they don't want a situation where you're just giving out equity and diluting them because it's one pie, right? So it's a lot more what we call governance when you take on investor money, big investor money, and you have to have a board. My position as a CEO, as a founder, really transitioned to a chairperson and a a chief executive officer when I got my board. Because my job now is to be a a very good governor of these boards' responsibilities. And also there's a a legal term that we call it. It's a fiduciary. Yeah, I am legally, financially – responsible 
for this company. I cannot make decisions that would put the finances of Blavity at risk. It would be illegal. Which is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and and what, what, what gets even more interesting is that those are sometimes the same chair members or board mm -hmm. members that end up getting rid of the founders. If you are, let's say you're missing your quarter, you're, let's say you're making, like, hey, we're going to do $10 million, you know, a year. And, and then next year we're going to do 20 million. And the year after that, we're going to do 30 million. Because when you raise VC money, they're not just looking for 10% growth every year. They're looking for doubling the business type growth. Because that's why you took money. If you wanted to grow 10%, you should have stayed a lifestyle business. Stay in a lifestyle <laughs> Stay business. Stay in a lifestyle business lane. But we're not just not. It's like big money growth, right? So especially in the early stages. So if you get in a situation where something happens and the business isn't growing as fast as what you thought it would do, if your projections are off consistently quarter over quarter over quarter, please believe there are conversations happening behind closed doors with or without you about – Maybe it's time for us to find another CEO. Maybe we should hire a president. And maybe you should just be a board chairperson. So is this kind of like when people foreclose on your business? <laughs> Man, it's tough. I mean, I have plenty of founder friends who some people choose to move out the CEO role and be a board member because they don't want to be running a 400, 500 person company. Like, yeah. Lord knows if we ever get that big, I probably would be like, I'm out. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of <laughs> transition happening with like different companies lately. Yeah. And we're like, where are the people going? Mm -hmm. Or who are these new people that are just coming in? Mm -hmm. And this is an example of like, okay, we need to go in a different direction because things are not making sense. Or it's just like the person who built the company that got you to your first 10 million may not be the same, have the same skill set, the same network, the same uh, energy to get you to 100 million in revenue. Got it. It's not always that easy. Or the person who can get you to $100 million in revenue may not be the same person who's going to get you and lead the organization to a billion in revenue. And what no one is saying is like, okay, here's the process. So let's run this process back. Mm -hmm. You have this company. Mm -hmm. Someone says, you need to go and raise money. You need to do this raise. And mm -hmm. then you're like, yeah, raise the money. Time to go. And it's so exciting because you're like, yeah, we're about to get paid. Sis. Yeah. I'm like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So you raise yeah. $50 million. Right. I mean, let's even start at two million dollars. Okay. Let's say let's <laughs> let's, let's start let's start reasonable right. here. Because okay. to be honest, I would say there's like two or three black people a year that raise the fifty mil plus, which level. is crazy. Like very, but even just not even just black people. Let's just say people. It's not yeah. that actually. As much as it's reported, there's it's not actually that many people raising raising money like 50 that. Million, so let's say they million. raise three million dollars, okay. and I'm like, that's good. Yes. Right. Congratulations. Yes. This company says, you know. We believe in you. We're going to invest in this company. You give them. What is the percentage that you would give for $3 million? Let's say the company is valued at, um, it's tough. Let's say the company is valued at $10 million. You're giving away 30%. You're giving away 30% of your company. Now, here is the secret thing mm -hmm. that no one talks about. <laughs> they give you this money. Yes. But they also set milestones. Yeah. For your business. Mm -hmm. And I learned this game from you. Mm -hmm. What happens when you don't meet those milestones? And what do those milestones normally look like? Uh, it's really tough in the boardroom. I mean, we've definitely had times where, like, we're off slightly on our milestones. What's the craziest thing you've seen, not in your company, but overall? You've been in this game for a long oh, time. Oh, I see a lot of stuff. I mean, I'm an angel investor, so that's the other thing. When you're an angel investor, you get all the investor updates okay. in the early stages. So, Give every, me an example. So I'm an early uh, investor in a company called Boxed Up, okay. uh, which is a great company. Uh, the CEO is called, named Donald Boone. Um, he's from – used to live in Seattle, worked for Amazon, moved his family and the company to Atlanta, and they started off being a company that helps people – uh, delivers video equipment to their home. Got it. So mm -hmm. I I met him because we were looking for a black business to support during COVID to help us ship all of the equipment when we were doing things like Afrotech remotely. And we needed everyone to have high quality cameras. So I'm like, we're not going to buy all these cameras because we had to ship all this stuff yeah. out. So we used Donald's company. So I invested in him. I was like, I like you. I think this is great. Of course, it's going to change after COVID, but like, I believe in you. So invested in his company. Now he's changed his business model three or four times. 
which is okay because that's what you do when you're early stage. Got it. You pivot, you adjust, but you need investors who are like, okay, great. I support you. And not yeah. like, well, I didn't invest – in this, in this idea, yeah, right. this is what I invested in. Right. So outside of your personal situation, you've seen people have investors mm -hmm. decide to pivot in their business mm -hmm. and then the investor says no. Well, I don't have the authority in my term sheet to say no. Wow. So I didn't put enough money in to have a say. I'm not on the board. So mm -hmm. really, I'm just here to support. Wow. Right. Uh, and Typically, as an angel investor, you lose 99% of what you invest. Like most angel investors don't make their money back. You do it because you support the person. You want to be along for their journey. Maybe you do make some money back. Maybe you don't. Got it. Um, so let's say whoever led whoever's business, Donald's, anybody's business, and they want to change plans, the board can say no. Because you're presenting this at the board meeting, and then you're stuck going down a, a route that you don't even feel passionately about. You're an employee. Wow. So this is the part of taking money yeah. that no one talks about. It's like you lose a portion of your business because yeah. you're selling it, but then you don't have the same level of authority in your business. And you shouldn't because you just gave someone just gave you ten million dollars. And you shouldn't. <laughs> you know. But if you are that person who is used to navigating, mm -hmm. kind of making all of the decisions, this can be a different world for you. It is definitely a power dynamic and there's definitely situations and it's hard because you can't talk about this stuff publicly. So, yeah. you know, we don't know what happens behind closed doors at many of these companies. I know this stuff because I have investor friends. Yeah. I look at a lot of deals and there's a lot of companies that look like they're doing well. And then all of a sudden they've sold the company and you're like, wait a minute, or they file for bankruptcy. Or they file for bankruptcy. Or you think they should be filing for bankruptcy because they cannot honor their <laughs> their products. They're not delivering on time. You can you can tell there's they're something They're not paying up. their employees. They're not paying their employees. Um, it's tough. You know, I think all that glitters is not gold when it comes to business. And I was quiet for a really long time because I didn't... I didn't want anybody to know. I'm like, don't look at me. Look yeah. over there. Yeah. <laughs> don't leave him look over But now you come, you're coming off the box now. <laughs> well, now I'm like, all right, we good. She's outside now, y'all. And she's doing podcast interviews now and giving us all the game. But I think that I'm blown away to know that people, when we are raising this money, you're taking this income in. Yeah. You are losing a lot of your ownership in your business. Yeah. And people are giving you this money. It's almost like, okay, I'm giving you a loan. And they're giving you this deposit, this money up front that may be one to five million or 10 million or 20 million, however much they raise. Mm -hmm. But there are also terms yes. that have to be met. Yes. And let's talk a little bit about what happens to people when yeah, they can, don't meet those terms. You can terms. get fired. You know, CEOs can get fired and move on and start another company. I mean, there's plenty of founders who founded businesses who are no longer the CEO of their company. Wow. Like, y'all know them. So you just lose your business. You maintain your equity stake and your ownership. They can't take what you've earned. Um but Which, you're no longer in control. But like you're someone no else is running your business. The yes. And that's not, again, that's not always a bad thing. Like again, there will be a time when I say I should not be the CEO of Blavity. But there's a difference. But you will from, never know. From outside looking in, you won't know if I got kicked out <laughs> or if I stepped out. Yeah. And a lot of people are getting quietly kicked out. A lot of people are getting mutually understanding agreements and arrangements for people to transition to, to another role. Yeah. And yeah. we don't know this side of business. No. Which is why I'm so happy that you're here today because Everyone always glamorizes this raise, 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 raise. But there are deliverables that come with just pressure that raise. Yeah. There's financial responsibilities, legal responsibilities and pressure. Yeah. I love but it. But you're getting $10 million. You're getting $10 million. So. But you better make that math math after you take that the math million. has got to math. And I think <laughs> that's what I see a lot when I look at founders and I'm looking at their decks and they're like, oh, I'm thinking about fundraising, da, da, da. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to fundraise for? They're like, oh, I really need to pay myself a salary. I say, Arr! excuse me, what? You want to raise because you want to pay yourself a salary? Don't do this. Let's find mm -hmm. another way to make you some money. Let's find another way to grow your revenue. Let's find another way for you to have more take-home pay. Yeah. But 
do not fundraise just because you personally need the income to sustain your vision and your dream. There's a million and one businesses in America that exist without venture capital money. Yeah. You need to be a venture backable business, which means you need to be a business that could be big enough to give back 10x on the investment. If somebody gives you a, a million, are you going to give them back 10 million? If the answer is you can't even think through that, then you probably don't want to take that money. Don't even start fundraising because yeah. you're not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> and they're going to beat you down. And yeah. you're going to be like, oh, my God, the NBC is so hard. And yeah. they don't want to give me any money. And they just don't want to give black people any money. And I'm like, I look at their deck and I'm like, bruh. Yeah, this isn't this isn't it. This and ain't you, it. You've been in the game for a very long time. Yeah. A very long time. What would you do differently now if you were starting over from scratch? I don't think I would have made a media business, that's for sure. I mean, the media industry is terrible Ooh, right now. Let's talk about it. I'll talk all about it. I have all types of podcasts telling people, do not build a media company. Tell me why. So media is going through a transition. You know, I mean, you can see it. You can see the bankruptcies. Vice just filed for bankruptcy. You know, Vice owns um, Refinery29. Vice, of course, they have Vice TV, Vice Land. I mean, we loved Vice content. Yeah, we did. But- the math didn't math. Uh, you know, BuzzFeed is now a publicly traded company. It's the first digital media company to go public. They're having a tough time. Their stock is under 60 cents. Bro. So what would you do if you I were starting would, over from <laughs> scratch right now? If I knew what I knew today, I would have built a B2B, which is a business-to-business -business SaaS, subscription as a service, boring as tech company. Like, you would not see my face. Let it would sip, not be sexy. Sip my matcha. It would be a boring, boring business that helps random faceless? business be. Do we say faceless? It's absolutely faceless. Why is it faceless for you? Because it should have nothing to do with me. <laughs> like, it should literally be some random arbitrage in the world. Like, AI is popping up. Okay, cool. You know, like, we're going to build an AI tool that helps businesses do this and pay me a monthly fee to do that thing. That's what I would build. Because those are the businesses with the higher, highest valuations. If you really get the product right, you don't even have to be that complicated. Like, at Blavity, we use a, a company called Bill.com, and we use, uh, like, Docsend. If you look at the websites and the, the platform, you're like, this ain't even that fancy. These companies are worth a billion dollars. Wow. So you are saying faceless? Faceless. Serve one type of customer doing one thing that's repetitive that I can charge you monthly for. And that's the game. That would be my game. That would be your game. Starting over from scratch right now with all of the, that you know and all that you've been through, you will go in a total different direction. No consumer, no CPG, no advertising. No. All right. <laughs> game given. However, <laughs> that's not what I have. <laughs> However. <laughs> I have a diversified company. We do have a, a SaaS subscription business, which we just launched this year called Talent Infusion, which is a part of AfroTech, which helps companies hire diverse talent. For sure. And that's an offshoot of AfroTech because we've been really successful there, which is a consumer brand, right? We do have ad technology that's a B2B solution for media companies on the back end. But at the front end, it's, the, it's media. Yeah. But what I will say is you have this long portfolio yeah. of companies. Long portfolio of companies. Yeah, getting, so you did something there. right. I'm grateful and we have navigated a lot and we are very successful. It could have been easier. Yeah. Like you still have to put in the same amount of effort and time to build a $400 million business mm -hmm. as you do to build a $4 billion business or $1 billion business. Are you tired yet? Girl, yeah, I'm tired. I'm seven months pregnant. What are you talking about? <laughs> so we are literally in Morgan's <laughs> house right now. She's prego. Yes. And I'm hot. Are you ready to like retire? You're like ready to retire? No, I love my life. Okay. I mean, we're also at this really fun part where you're not on the struggle bus anymore. When you're okay. an early startup, you're really hustling against the clock because someone gave you a million dollars 
and it's running out. <laughs> and that million <laughs> runs quick. So it's like, because once you start paying everybody, honey, you that know, million can be gone in like six months to a year gone, when you're paying people. Gone. Then you got to pay for the product. You for know, sure. you got to do all these things. So you're racing against the clock constantly. That's why people raise so often. They raise the first million, then they got to raise again. Yeah. And then you get diluted again. You sell it 20% again. <laughs> And then you got to get back to work. And you keep working. Yeah. You're raising and you're working. So I took myself off that hamster wheel and said, we're just going to build. And then I hired a bunch of executives that have been really helpful at just maturing the company. You know, we have vacation policies and, you know, paternal leave and a parental all leave and all of the things. Yeah. You know, we're fancy now. And I'm very proud of yeah. how you, far we've come. That's, that's, that's a different level. Yeah, it's a lot. And um, and so I feel like we're in a place where now I can go back to being an innovator because I'm not having to be as much of an operator. Okay. And so that's the fun part. I mean, that's like, that's the dream. Of course. But they say, let me just say this. They say everybody has a number, right? Oh, there's a number. Not in this economy. They can't afford <laughs> me though. <laughs> everybody has a number. So let me ask you, what would your number be? Today. Well, I know my personal number is 50 million. And I've talked about this before. It got me in a lot of trouble on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go over there. Um, but I mean, like, okay, this is your, these are all your companies. It's How not much about do you that. want? It's not about that. That's that's the key because it's about my ownership level. Okay, go ahead. Right? Because let's say the company sold for a billion dollars, but I only owe 10%. Mm, well, actually, that's we, a good we would point. be good because that would be 100 because million. We, but like, let's say I only owed 1%, you know, yeah. then we'd be like, mm, $10 million, that's not enough. So you say 50 million is your number. 50 million is Morgan D. Bond's take home number. And you're like? I mean, we like, <laughs> sign me up to be an employee at whatever company. <laughs> like, you, you can't leave. Like, okay. actually, when you sell your company, you don't leave. So typically, when you sell your company, you stay on. For at least two to three years, that's a part of your terms and conditions, their terms and conditions for you. So I just would become an employee of said unicorn company that would buy me. So you're like 50 million, sign me up. And a salary, and now I'm an employee, and you can tell me what to do. And you down for that. Yeah. But 50 million means you're buying Blavity for a lot more than 50 mil. Because we, we want the number. we like, what's the number? <laughs> like, if I want to buy Blavity right now, how much would I have to pay for that? Like, You'd what would your number be? at least 400. 400 what? Million. Okay. Yeah, probably. I mean, okay. that inserts, would make all my investors would be like. Inserts the crickets sure. right here. <laughs> all, my, all my board would be like, we should take that deal. Like, you know, because it's a shitty market. Yeah. It's a terrible market. And the reason why I'm talking about the market is because it's always relative, right? We don't know when this market is going to come back up. So I would rather have $50 million in, in this market. Yeah. Think about how much we could do. You could buy everything because everything, nobody can't buy anything. <laughs> you could buy every house because all the housing prices are down and nobody can afford to buy it because of the interest rates. You could buy all types of businesses that are running out of money. For sure. That can't raise. I mean, it would be the this would be the moment to liquidate. But also nobody has the money to buy you for these prices. So you say, all right, give me this. This is my number. Mm -hmm. And when you are talking about this, you're like excited, like, baby, you know, give me my 50 million. If you put it by Blavity, I'm asking for about 400 million. And you're excited. You're like, I'm ready to be an employee. If this is the number. And don't try to do the math and try to back into <laughs> my equity calculation because it's not actually accurate the way don't I said it. Don't try to do the math, y'all. Don't be trying to, you're not going to be trying to, well, that means if she said this and 50 percent, stop. Stop it. Just stop it. <laughs> so with that being said, yeah. the excitement that you are showing and your willingness to say, hey, like, I'll be employees, sign me back up. Why do you think mm -hmm. that in the Black community, when people do sell their companies, mm -hmm. there is so much backlash? Why is that backlash like that? Oh, it's terrible. I mean, I've had nightmares. Like, wake up in the middle of the night like sweating yeah. about the anxiety of how our community, how we treat one another. And it's just terrible. What is it? Why is there such a negative undertone there 
when we talk about black women selling yeah. their companies, we've seen it happen, yeah. you know, recently. And it's like, people just don't get it. You know, I am cheering on, shout out to Monique. She shout just, out to Monique. Yeah, love She took like, that hit. Okay, Man. come on, Monique. Set the bar, set the tone, paving the way. When I hear it happen, I'm like, that's how you pave the way. Why is it important? You know, I've had to do a lot of like self-reflection and try to have compassion because it used to really piss me off. And it, it's actually super detrimental to us as entrepreneurs and CEOs that this is our own audience and consumer's reaction, which I'll get to in a second. But the, the reason why I think that people in our community have such a, a visceral negative response is because we have been systemically underserved. Wow. And so when we finally get somebody mm. serving us at scale with the money and the, the everything, and they have great products, we're like, and then they're, we feel like they've sold because they did literally we sell. Feel like they feel like they've sold <laughs> out. out. Yes. <laughs> Let's just be clear. It's always they sold out. Right. The product's going to change. I'm like, the product should change. If you're going to ship a product that used to be built in someone's kitchen to a international supply chain so they can have their product existing in Ghana, it cannot be the same formula. It will literally have bacteria in it or whatever. And then you guys will be like, well, they have bacteria in their product. Like, we can't win. You can't. <laughs> so my perspective is that it's, a, it's actually something that is a sign of um, – that we as a community have a, we don't have enough. There's not enough of us making it so that if somebody is out the game, if Monique is out the game, there's not like another Mayel. Exactly. Right? Or if the gathering spot sells, there's no other gathering spot. <laughs> right? So we have a deficit of mindset because we don't have that much. And so when we have something that's good, it just sucks. It feels shitty to for somebody who's white to own it now. That's the compassionate in me. The CEO in me is like, get it together, people. Yeah. Because what the unintended consequence of all these negative reactions that we have and we show so publicly is that when the lip bar or another beauty brand wants to sell, there's going to be a white executive at these companies who's going to say, well, what if all their customers don't buy from them when they're white owned? Maybe we should devalue them. Maybe we should discount their valuation. Mm. Because what if some of their 15% of their customers are just going to stop buying the product based off of my data calculations of the Instagram comments? So, what you're saying is like, you're ruining it. You're, you're ruining, lowering our you value. You're ruining it for someone else's legacy. You're making it so much harder. But people for us. of other ethnicities are buying, building, and selling. The game for them is to build and sell. That and is that's how what they happens. build wealth. That is what happens in, we're in a capitalistic corporate society. This is America. Now you all may say, well, we don't want to be in a capitalistic society. We don't want to be in America. Like I get it, black folks. I get it. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> but we are. We are. We are. <laughs> we are. And so, yes, when you sell your company, it's not just that founder. It's all your employees. Yeah. You know, they're getting equity and they're able to sell their shares. It's all those people who invested in you. When if and when Donald sells boxed up, I get my money back and then some. Yeah. And right? one of the things that you are really big on is I'm going to live my life. Mm -hmm. I am going to automate my business. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make millions of dollars and I'm not going to live in a hustle bustle world. Nah. What transition for you when you just got to that point? Like what happened when you said, I'm going to delegate, team build yeah. and go to Greece for 15 days out of the month? <laughs> I'm out. Um, <laughs> you know, I think that I always felt like in the early stages of Blavity, you know, I was 
there was no, even to this day, there's no role that is beneath me, you yeah. know? customer has a question, points out an error, I'm going to read that email and respond just as much as anybody else at the company. And I think that's the key thing. As long as I remain humble and grounded in like who I am, my role and my responsibility, then why would I not take advantage of the opportunities and the privileges that my hard work and luck have afforded me? Yeah. Why would I sit on the hustle bus Mm -mm, take me off take immediately. You off the hustle bus. <laughs> immediately. Listen, I'm right there with you. I'm like, now I don't want. I want to work smart, not yeah. hard. Like I'm not trying to be out here on Instagram dancing around all day. Like I'm not trying to be out here 40 years old, 50 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, grinding. Like I can feel it. Like I don't know if you can feel it, sis, but like I can feel it. I'm getting yeah. to the age now where I'm like, I want to enjoy my life. Mm -hmm. I'm tired early. I'm sleepy at 10. Yes. I'm not trying to be out here in the streets. No. That's just not the life for me. And yeah. I think that we have glamorized the hustle life so much. And I've done it. Like, I remember I being in my 20s I think there's a level of hustling that. Yeah. that you had to do. Like, you got to do it, I don't though. believe in people just graduating from college and being like, oh, I need to go on vacation. I'm like, bro, from what? Like, yeah. what are you talking about? Like, You got to do it in your 20s, though. Because it feels different in those late 30s. Right. It so if you're different. kicking it in your 20s, then you're going to be hustling in your 30s. If you're hustling in your 30s, you might be able to kick it. I mean, when you're hustling in your 20s, 20s, you might be kicking it in your 30s. There's no way to not put in the time and the hard work and the effort and the grit to get to a successful and extraordinary life. If you want an extraordinary life, an extraordinary life, then you have to do extraordinary things. When everyone's doing this, you're doing this. But people on the internet be like, I, I want to live. I want to be, I just want to like work on a farm and travel and make a million dollars a year. And that's not realistic. I'm just like, come on. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? What are we talking about? I can't even do that. What are we talking about? <laughs> you know, I just think that times are changing. Yeah. And the social media has put us in a place where we can kind of live in Lululand. Mm -hmm. And I realized that what we see is not reality and we're not seeing what it took to get to these places. Right. We show the final product. We don't show the process. Right. And because people are not showing the process, you don't see people crying in their car. You yeah. don't see people getting loans from their family members. Mm -hmm. You don't see people up at four or five o'clock in the morning looking like, a crazy person with their robe on, their hair standing on That's top right. of their head. You don't see people struggling to get their kids out the house mm -hmm. early in the morning in the wintertime. You don't see them losing money mm -hmm. and having to go borrow money from their friends to start their businesses. No one is showing this side mm -hmm. of the multimillionaire who can sit here and say, or y'all ain't following that person. Give me four hundred million dollars. <laughs> like that's what you're gonna have to do to yeah. say, give me four hundred million dollars. Well, people aren't inspired by somebody talking about how hard it is. They want to be inspired by oh, it looks so easy. Yeah, and you come, so, but that's what not why they listen to our podcast. Yeah, you you come <laughs> just such a long way. Yeah, and I think that people need to know how many years have you been in the game. Yeah, over 10 years at this point. 10 years in the game. And I'm young, Ten. so it's like I really just worked. Yeah, you've worked, but now you're transitioning. I have a little bit more of a balance. I feel like you are in your soft life season. I'm softer. <laughs> I'm softer. I'm a little more around. You know? But, you know, I think um, – but I still work hard. And, you know, another – I will say we, we are talking a lot about this stuff, but we're also coming from a perspective as black women. And so yeah. we have to acknowledge that there are people in this world who are second generation and third generational wealth that do just get born into the soft life. Like yeah. this baby is going to be born into the soft life. Yes. Shout out to the, uh, my little trust fund baby, you know? <laughs> so like we have conversations now amongst <laughs> me and my partner and then also me and our family of like, damn, how are we going to have, what are we going to do? And, and let me just do a plug real quick. So Morgan's man, her man, her man, he's over here. He has a huge production company. Uh -huh. He's amazing. He does not play. Like, this is all him here with this setup. But as she just sat here and said, like, shout out to my trust fund baby. He's behind the camera like, yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> because we really, this is one of the things that we're thinking about as we're becoming parents of like, okay, so are we going to not go to Saint-Tropez? 
because we don't want him to be like, oh, yeah, I spent my weekends in Central Bay. Like, I don't want a lame little baby boy. Like, <laughs> nah. You know, but I'm like, oh, but like, are we not going to go to Martha's yeah. Vineyard? Like, do we leave him at home? Like, you know, so. The exposure. He will have a softer life. He will still be a black man in America in Tennessee. For sure. So, you know. Espe- less <laughs> emphasis on Tennessee. <laughs> Listen, it's hard out here. So we think about that too. Like, okay, he not going to get this type of car. Yeah. You know, he going to be driving a Honda. I don't care what kind of car daddy got. Yeah. Don't matter. So, yes, we are talking about work ethic. We're talking about hard work. And I think for the person listening to this, there's a part of our generation, yes. But there is a world in which our children and our babies, Rio's the same way. I'd be like, Rio be on the phone. I'd be like, girl, what you complaining yeah. about? Yeah, Rio's like, <laughs> she told me the other day, she's like, mom, I need multiple streams. No, she said multiple sources of income. And I said, what are you talking about? She's like, I need multiple sources of income. So she launched her YouTube channel and it's just like the exposure is so important because your kids grow up in a way that they see what you're doing mm-hmm. and they think that this is a normal life. Because it is their normal. But it's it their is, normal. For a lot of America in non-Black communities, it is it is their normal life too. Yeah. So we are going to have to work on our own trauma and our own therapy <laughs> to not sure. pass on our bullshit trauma from busting our butts onto them. Yeah. It's going to be so weird. It is very weird. <laughs> and another thing that I'm making sure that she's seeing now is I think that, you know, I I was home as a mom ever right. since I had her. She's 11 years old now. And I've always, she's never seen me work in a job. Mm. I've always ran a business ever since she was born. And I'm now allowing her to see the softer side mm-hmm. of me because I've always been businesswoman, traveling, speaking, right. but now allowing her to see me relax yeah. and be happy and, and, and experience joy and love and all the things. And you have been on 10 in business now. Mm-hmm. Um, and now you're prego mm-hmm. and you know, you're all in love on, on social and Norman all the things. <laughs> it's very cliche. How important, <laughs> how important is it for these super successful women yeah. like yourself to make time for love and that connection to come their way? Oh, I mean, it's so important and you have to be intentional in the same way that you're intentional about building your business and building that spreadsheet and making sure nothing's going to get away between you and what you're trying to do and your dreams and da 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 (laughs) You should match that same energy when when it's time for you to be a, find your partner or become a mother. And I think, um, you know, we all have gone through our own ups and downs of exes and dating yes, and things like that. Absolutely. But what I'll say is. And it's not pretty. <laughs> it's not pretty. But like shout out to all of them because I learned so much about me. Yes. Dating every single man that I've ever dated. And I think what it taught me is there's no in between. There like you not. can't be. I'm going to be in a fully committed, healthy relationship and find my partner in life. And I'm going to build a bajillion dollar business and fundraise and be running around the country Can and we doing be honest stuff. about that? I'm just saying. Can we toast to that? <laughs> it's not possible. I'm sorry. It's, it's BS. It's really hard. It's very Maybe hard. Maybe someone somewhere said it, but it ain't me. And I don't know about you all, but I'm going a, I'm to a keep it real. Like I'm just getting to the point where I'm like, what am I doing all this for? Because I think that I can have a pretty happy life with this amount. Yeah. And live the life of my dreams. And yeah. am I happy at home? Because here's the thing. Like, you can have the glitz and the glam online, but are you loved at home? Right? Do you feel that love? You're compensating for something. Yeah. Like, are you loved at home? Do you feel taken care of? Yeah. Right? Um, do you have that support? Yeah. If all the floods and tornadoes and everything came your way because of global warming, are you okay not leaving the house for five days with the person that you live with? And I think yeah. in COVID, a lot of people say, eh, eh. <laughs> actually, no. <laughs> Let me just, I was going to say that. I was going to say COVID showed 
us a lot yeah. about like relationships. And this is why I tell people, be careful admiring all of these relationships online mm -hmm. because you don't know what it looks like when the cameras go off. COVID did a thing. COVID definitely gave people some chance to slow down and assess what was Can going on Can you sit here with the same person for five to seven days yeah. for 24 hours a day? Right. No. No. It's like your job in that space was keeping you sane. Yeah. Yeah, you and live it's in just, separate lives. You live in two separate lives. And it's just so important. I think, you know, we get, you know, so many women right now, like, I want to be a millionaire. That's it. <laughs> I know. I don't know what, like, why? <laughs> First of all, a millionaire ain't nothing compared to <laughs> the inflation and everything going on. So we're going to aspire. I'm getting let's to get, the point. Let's get up. Let's or I'm like, y'all fought this hard to work. <laughs> <laughs> but I also understand, like, if you have a nine to five and you're making 140 and you feel like you worked really hard to get to that 140 and then inflation hits. Yeah. And then, you know, your AC unit goes out and, 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 and then you're yeah. like, hey. Yeah, yeah. I'm just working just to pay everybody else. I can't even really, like, do anything. And I'm joking when I say that, but... I'm glad that we have the opportunity as women to build wealth now. I mean, yeah. just just to be, just recently we were able to get our own bank account. It's 1960, right? Like, Jesus can Christ. you believe that? No. Um, but it's there's so much more, mm -hmm. and for me, I'm just like, you have to prioritize your love life, yeah, your friendships, your family. I don't know what it is with me, but I feel like I'm going through this stage where I'm realizing what's more important more and more every day. Yeah. And it's less about, you know, the social media or just the money. It's like, okay, I'm getting to that second half of my life right now. But I think that's what we all aspire to, right? It's like at some point you may have thought, like my number may, I may have thought my number was 50 million, uh -huh. but actually- there may be a situation where I accept 40. Yeah. You know? Sis just said 10 last. <laughs> I thought you were going to say 10, but go ahead. Well, no, 50 is a very specific number. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to just break it down for you real quick so y'all can understand where I'm coming from from this 50. The 50 you because- You do about that 50. I don't. Because here's why. When you take- You give me $50 million, we invest it. I don't even touch it. I just invest it. The stock market on an average year, S&P 500, gives off 10% every year. Mm -hmm. Five million that I can and just- And that's what you're, that's, that is your five million to stay home with. That's five million that I'm running around doing whatever. Spending five million dollars is not easy in post-tax cash. It's not. It's not easy. So that's just assuming I do I nothing with this. I could live off of five million a year. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm being honest. Like I could literally, right? And I mean, like never leave the house, never work again. But you could probably live off of four million a year. <laughs> yeah. you I know? could probably do three. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so we could maybe sell for thirty. You know what I mean? So I'm when lie. you really do the math, it's not about the numbers. About the it, you know, we keep the you put this in the trust, and then you have the interest, and you live off your interest. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, we good. So when I hear that people are Oh, they got a hundred million dollars. I'm just like, but why? Yeah. Why? What are you going to do with that? What are you going to do yeah. with that? Travel. But $10 million versus $5 million incrementally, your lifestyle is basically the same. Like it you is. can fly on the private jets. You can spend two months, three months, four months. You can have multiple houses because you're going to get loans off of your assets. You're not buying these things. These are loans. You take a yeah. loan off of your 5 million. Exactly. You're off your 50. That's what the rich people do. You take a loan off your 50. You don't pay taxes on the loan. Yeah. And I mean, Come not on only now. that, they're borrowing against what they have in the stock market. They're not even touching it. They're, they're not even liquidating they're it. They're not even liquidating. They're just taking the loan out against it. Against their assets. And against then, their assets. And then their income is technically because they Which have- Which is how they avoid the taxes. Ding, ding, ding. Anyways, we didn't too deep. We you know. It's Dave Ramsey up in here. It's getting a little Dave Ramsey-ish up in here. Yes. But, but this is the stuff that people really have to understand. When you set the goal of a million, why? What are you really trying to get to? 
a million in income, pre-tax, post-tax. I need you to get more specific, yeah. sis. Are we talking net gross? We're talking assets? We're talking <laughs> KPIs here. Like, what what's, going? what's going on? Get more specific. Get so specific that you know how much it costs for you to live your dream life every single month and work backwards from there. If it costs you $50,000 a month to live your dream life, I'm talking car, house, housekeeper, kids doing whatever, Nails, yeah. whatever. See, since so you delegate and all, you're like, I'm delegating. Yeah, you I'm, heard what I said, yeah. driver. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not driving anywhere, but that's because I don't like to drive. I don't like to drive either. Yeah, who dropped you off here? Not yeah. you. <laughs> right. Stay on my business. <laughs> but I, I love this for us. Yeah. And, and I love to see now I'm seeing so many women who are CEOs. Yeah. And they are now like, okay. My love life is important. Right. My, my family is important. Right. Like I need to make this no, I'm time because I'm pregnant. Child. Prego, Ooh, it's hot. And her man, her man, her man is over here getting it together, y'all. We did a podcast <laughs> for her today, and it was the most hilarious thing that I have seen <laughs> because y'all are too funny. <laughs> but what I admire about y'all is the teamwork. You know, it's not just teamwork; it's partnership. One hundred percent. And it made me realize like how important it is to have like a partner who is on the same page and mm -hmm. who can just, it's like a puzzle. It fits perfectly. You guys are just kind of like together. Yeah. What would you say to women who are out here and they are successful and they are looking to find that person? What should they be looking for? I think you should just be looking for ease. I think before I met Josh, I tried to fit pieces of puzzles that didn't fit together and I felt like, well, you know, I should compromise more or like I should like be more understanding or you make all these excuses. I made a lot of excuses for a lot of things. Why, why do women do that? Because it's just like, oh, my God, I'm exhausted. Like, do I really got to – this was this guy's great, but he's not my great, mm. you know? So I think – a lot of excuses made and then a lot of just talking myself out of things. But when you find the right person, you don't even have to think about it. It's the ease. It's like so boring. Yeah. It should be that boring. Like it should be that easy that you're kind of bored. You know what blows my mind? You didn't say, oh, he need to be a millionaire. Like, oh, he needs to have this house. No. He need to drive this car. Because you're so past that. Like yeah. it's, it's the peace of mind. Yes. Remember when we heard men say like, she need to be my peace. Yeah, that's how I feel. <laughs> I am that man. <laughs> it's true. It's awful. It's awful. But that's how I feel. I'm but like, now you, you start my to peace. see it. You start to yeah. see it. Because peace of mind is probably the most valuable thing that you can have. And so when freeing. you can have it with a person, it's like, okay, we, we great. Like, you don't got to be dumb rich you don't have to have 50 cars we really don't care about yeah. like your house like as long as you have a, ho a house and an asset that's fine but what it what makes us like happy is the fact that we can be around each other and it's peaceful literally my brain capacity and my ability to process information and be able to think about new dreams of my my own life has tripled, doubled, bejupled because I'm in so much peace in this part of my life yeah. that it makes me expansive. When you're constantly worried about, well, why isn't you texting me back and looking at other people's Instagrams and trying to find, zooming in to see, is that him in the club? Is that his shoes is back there? Is that his shoes? <laughs> well, how many drinks? You know when you do it. Is that red lipstick on that cup? Do you know I what think saying? someone else is there. And don't y'all try to make me sound like I'm crazy because I know y'all been doing it too. Go on your girl's Instagram and talk about some Girl, what's your blocking? Login? Is he blocking my stories? I can't see that one story. You know, that is so much energy. That is decision-making brain power that is not it's spent a distraction. on self. Mm -hmm. You know, you're giving him all this energy. I love my man, but he actually does not give all that. Like, he doesn't give that kind of energy <laughs> for me. He could be gone. I'm like, I don't know where he is. What are you doing? <laughs> Josh, don't kill him. <laughs> but that's, but that, I, I hope and I pray. And that's my, that would be my affirmation to any woman who's listening to this, who's like, I've got it together. I hear y'all. Assets, got it. Interest, got it. Don't sell my company, got it. Okay, bae. Mm, feeling a little anxious. Yeah. 
Just like find the man that gives you ease. Even if he doesn't look like what you thought he was supposed to look like, even if his bank account that part. doesn't bank account the way you thought. That part. Because let me just, can we talk about that just one second? <laughs> there are so many women, women that have this vision. I keep hitting this microphone. Mm-hmm. They have this vision of what he needs to look like. Yeah. He needs to be tall. He needs to have a six pack. He mm-hmm. needs to have green eyes. Mm-hmm. He needs to like <laughs> Not green eyes. Have, you know, big calf muscles, all the things. Like it's all this stuff. He needs to be swaggy. He needs to wear these kind of clothes. He needs to wear this type of designer. He needs to fly first class. Da, you da, da, miss da, da, out da. on your blessings. Yeah. And it's like, you not fit like that, you well, know? Don't think Kevin Samuels. <laughs> this is how Kevin Samuels was go down. We're not going to go there. But, but seriously, it's like, sometimes we want what we don't even have. Yeah. Right? That's but right. But I'm just also going to say that the physical, like, you got to get past that sometimes. Yeah. Because you'll miss out on your blessing because he's not six feet tall. Which is, yes. Yes. I agree. Or he's not fit. Exactly. Or whatever. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> whatever. He got two kids. Whatever. <laughs> Tell them what's the most important. Peace. Ease. And just peace of mind and feeling safe. I am this man's princess. And he literally calls me his princess. And I feel like a princess. And that's what's as important. As much as one can know how much a princess feels like. But that's how <laughs> I feel. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I am a princess. And you deserve that. Yeah. And I feel like once you start experiencing that, it is just confirmation mm-hmm. because you look back and you and you're like, why did I ever? How? Could, okay. Oh my god! How could I ever? I'm so embarrassed. The for bar me. is set. <laughs> the bar is set so high. Yes. After that, I've had moments where I've looked back and I'm like, girl, I'm like Ronnie. What were you thinking? What like you had to step it up a little bit. You yeah. didn't know who you were. You know how Whitney had that song, like I didn't know my own strength. That's right. <laughs> it's like turn that song on, yeah. ride in the car. But don't turn it up so high <laughs> that, that, that you miss out on mm-hmm. the good one. So yes, that is if you learn nothing else from us today, <laughs> it's this. <laughs> and don't be too independent that you end up. Oh, that's a good that's a good note because a lot uh-huh. of men probably look at us and say, you don't need me because yeah. you don't need me to pay your bills. You don't need me to do this. You don't need me to do that. And I am not the I don't need a man girl. Yeah, you have to. No, I don't no. think people no, know that you. they're that. I don't think that anyone explicitly says I don't need a man. I think that we have been working so hard and have been so independent for so long, so self-sufficient, you know, picking up our own bags, making sure we were safe, locking our doors, doing all the things that we don't know. That you're like that. That you're like that. That you're coming off that way. And if you've been this independent woman for so long. I was that girl. It takes work. Right. To change it. A lot of work. Did you have to do some work to change that? I read all types of books. Shout out to my leak who gave me a lot of book recommendations. I'm like, I have a book called like How to Date as an Alpha Woman. Like I had to like go that far to unlearn. There's a book called Trusting Your Love that I recommend. Okay. Um, another book called Attached, which is about like your attachment in relationships. So you have to reverse everything that you've learned in work. In and business. it's crazy <laughs> because I think for me, it was like totally opposite. Like I'm very dominant in business, uh-huh. but like with my man, I'm soft. Like I'm, yeah. like I'm a total different person. Like yeah. it's just crazy. But it is a transition because mm-hmm. something that I did have to learn is how to turn work off when I came home. Mm-hmm. You got to light the candles. You got to just get in your zone. <laughs> you got to do all the things. But yeah, no, you can tell I, I have done some work on myself. You have. You have. Thank God. And and I can see you being led <laughs> these days. It is so hilarious. It's like, let, let that man do what he did. I don't even think about it, all types of stuff now. <laughs> People would be like, think I was nuts if they knew the amount of stuff that I don't even... You know what I think it is? I think it's that in your 20s, you want to be the boss. Yeah. Yeah. You're exerting yeah. your You want to be the boss. You want to be this, I can do it. I yeah. got this. And then I think just something happens in your 30s. Maybe not for everyone else, but for me, I feel like something happens in your 30s and you are like, please somebody come in and fix my life. Somebody else Like somebody, it. somebody tell me what to do. Yeah. Like I don't want to be the leader anymore. Mm-hmm. And you just- change and you grow and you're not trying to be you don't desire to be the one it's like just tell me where to go Mm -hmm. tell me what to do like i'm okay with just sitting back like i'm good on that in this part of my life now don't tell me what to do at work 
<laughs> don't, <laughs> don't send me a Slack message talking about what I need to do. Because <laughs> you're like, well, when it comes to office, I'm still that person. Absolutely. Okay. And I think that's what I had to learn was just like, you know, work is work. Yeah. Period. You also work together, though. We do. But In even some... when we work together, we I mean, that's where we struggle <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> where I'm like, you really want my opinion? Do you want my opinion or do you not want my opinion? You know, there's this thing that's like they ask, who is your friend that you would say would be a president? Uh-huh. When someone asks me that question, huh. I always say you. No. Yes, I'm like, <laughs> Morgan would be the president. <laughs> Morgan would 100% be the president because yeah. you are straight to it mm-hmm. when it comes to business. Yeah. For sure. So where do you see Morgan Devon and Blavity and Afrotech and Travel New York and all these companies? What is the goal for like the next five years? You know, it's so hard for me to predict the next five years. I'll be honest with you. What do you want to say? With that. Um, I think we should stay core to who we are, which is serving the black audience and black customers. I think there's an infinite amount of problems, even though I'm 10 years in, I think there's hundred years of, of work plus when it comes to solving unique problems for us as a community. And I'm committed to that. Do so, you think media is coming back? No. <laughs> okay. I had, to, I had to slide that one in there. No, Go ahead. I think that, um, how we consume information has changed. I think that's why there's strikes in Hollywood, why, you know, the negotiations, why you even hear people like Bob Iger, who's, you know, one of the best in the game, running the biggest media company, Disney, talk about some, we might, we might sell ESPN. Mm. For anyone to say we might sell the asset that every man in America watches two, three times a day because we don't think that's a core part of our business. Yikes. Think about that. So if, if Bob Iger and ESPN can't figure it out, I don't have that big of an ego to be like, oh, I can figure it out better than him. Wow. You know what I mean? Now, that was that was a, a eye opener. Yeah. So there's a lot going on. But this is how the world's shifting. You know, AI is real. People are going to try to regulate it and slow it down and da 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 But you can't slow it down. It's too late. Sorry. It's here. like men in black for real. Yeah. <laughs> I think space is a real thing. Yeah. You know, they're doing commercial flights to space and Mars and all these different places. Well, not commercial flights to Mars. Commercial uh, flights to space. They're having exhibitions to Mars. You know, I think there's a lot of things going to happen in our lifetime that we're going to look back and be like, damn, we missed that down, didn't we? We was over here talking about threads. Yeah. (laughs) We should have been looking at (laughs) We should have been setting up that um, faceless tech company. Our bunker. (laughs) We should have been a bunker in the back. Yeah. Do yeah. you know what I'm saying? We was worried about Morgan's worried about her 10 million. We should have been invested in the next spaceship going. We should be wherever. practicing astronomy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm still a little hurt from the submarine. <laughs> <laughs> the submarine was I'm, going the wrong like way. That, yeah, that that just hit me a little different. It was like, wow. Like I was honestly kind of like, I never even knew that this, this kind of stuff was happening. Why would we think about this? Yeah, we weren't even thinking about that. Why would we worry about this? Yeah, so, the, this excursion stuff is going to another level though. It's about to be real. Yeah. It's about to be real. And it's going to happen in our lifetime. So, you know, any one of those things, though, when you think about black people, we're going to be impacted by global warming at a disproportionate rate, disproportional rate, people of color. Uh, We're going to be impacted by the political climate. We're going to be impacted by AI and workforce development and people not having the skill and getting replaced by AI. That's what I exist for. Yeah. So... That's going to mean we're going to have to change eventually. Yeah. Sooner than later. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> so the five, the five to 10 year shift for you is? The five to 10 year shift for me is to continue to build product services and innovations for black folks in this country and multicultural folks as well. Because as we all merge and do all types of stuff, it's going to expand uh, the definition of how we identify. Um, and personally... It's to continue to use my own skill set to the best of my ability. So when there's a moment in which what I'm doing is not a match for my skill set, 
I will move on and do something else. Yeah. And and you're coming out of the shell right now with your personal brand. Yeah, I have to like do that. Can I just say I'm so proud of Thank you. you? Let me give you your flowers right here. Okay. Bam. Flowers, you've been coming out of your <laughs> shell, showing your personality. A lot of people didn't know who you were. They yeah. didn't know who the, you know, owner of Afrotech was. They didn't know who was behind Blavity. They didn't know any of those things. Mm -hmm. And now they get to see you. Why is that becoming so important to you now? Well, I think we just have – we're big enough that it's – I have the privilege to be able to just be myself without all the extra layers and protections that I had to have yeah. as a black female founder. Um, and I think the world has changed where, like, people are just more accepting of whole people now <laughs> and not just trying to put people in a box. So I feel good about that. And I also think we've just – our company has come a really long way and I'm so proud of my employees. I'm so proud of my co-founders, like yeah. everyone who's been rocking with us when it wasn't cool, it wasn't trendy, it wasn't easy. And I think people deserve to know, like it is possible. Yeah. And you were just like, you know, opening up. I just went to Costa Rica with you for CEO Spring Break. Shout yeah, out so to CEO Spring Break. See, can we toast to CEO Spring yes. Break? It's been a lot. <laughs> a lot of great things have come from CEO Spring Break. Mm -hmm. And we had a really good time. Yeah. And you have been really intentional about pouring back into Black CEOs. And I love that. Um, I, I don't think people realize how passionate you are on a business level with working with CEOs who who have companies that are, you know, seven and eight figure businesses. Mm -hmm. And you are just in the trenches with these people in a more intimate environment. Mm -hmm. You're you were not like the social media girl mm -mm. when we first met. Y'all, my friend is just <laughs> my she friend. She made me post more on Instagram. <laughs> so I did. She came out and she's like, okay, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna really get in the trenches and be a little more personable, a little more open. Mm -hmm. Um, but now you're like pouring back into black entrepreneurs. Um, they say that there aren't many black owned businesses that reach eight figures. Yeah. Why do you think that that's the case? Well, I think that um when you have to get when you get to that kind of numbers, it's because you've gotten a company and you've been able to build outside of yourself as a solopreneur. So you've hired people, you're able to incur the cost of the overhead of hiring people, so their benefits and all these things. It's expensive. It's hard. And it does take capital sometimes, you know, whether that's venture capital or taking out a loan or using your own savings. And we historically have been underfunded systemically. Yeah, we have It's harder to get loans from the bank. It's harder to leverage our assets. I mean, we have so many things that make it difficult to grow and scale yeah. to weather the storm. And then we even have funds, even like the Fearless Fund. Oh, terrible news. <laughs> Recently. Oh, I was so pissed. I'm like, we, shout out to Arian. That's yeah. my girl. You sitting out here trying to do amazing things to help black women move forward and black owned businesses move forward. And now we got to deal with this mess. If anything, the only good thing that will come from it is that she will now be in her company. Her fund will now be a national household name when they beat this. And hopefully she goes and raises so much money from all of these people once they know the work that she's doing, because that's the only good thing that can come from being yeah. attacked like this. And we and I support you, Arian. And I stand with you. Can we toast to the Fearless Fund? <laughs> Shout out to Fearless Fund because it was not easy raising, and I know it's not easy sustaining. Yes, yes, yeah. and, and I think it's things like that that are stopping us from hitting that eight figure mark. Right. Period. There is definitely an an agenda, yeah, in place to like. Okay, it's like why are we? Attacking people who are doing We're good. going backwards here. Yeah, we're going backwards. Fight somebody else. Get somebody else to Fight do it. Fight the submarines. Sure. Exactly. <laughs> but not, not no. the women and the group of women who are trying to fund other black women. They just minding their own business. It's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. But it just goes back to show. It just goes to show that it's so needed. Mm -hmm. It's so needed. So I commend what you're doing. Thank you. Um, thank you for all that you do. For the community, uh, bringing black people in tech together, the Afro tech, being that person that is putting out the good media, mm -hmm. right? The media that empowers, the media that educates. It's an amazing thing. Thank you for being here on the Girl CL Show. Thanks for having me. And, and let me make sure people know where 
to follow you because y- your girl is outside on Instagram right now. Okay. You can follow me on Instagram at Morgan Debon. If you want the business version of me, you can follow me on LinkedIn. Um, I also have a newsletter that comes out every week that I write. So I lots of books, links, things that I talk about, just making sure you guys have the resources for that. So it's a free newsletter. And um, my matcha brand is coming out soon. She's coming out with the matcha. Ronnie's yeah. drinking it right now. Is it better than Starbucks? I mean, let me see. <laughs> it's so smooth. It's smooth, <laughs> baby. You heard she it here made first. this for me. Yes. <laughs> Today. I'm so proud of you. We are in our exit stages right now. This is the retirement business. So <laughs> that's the fun business. That business is gonna break even. Yeah. Everyone <laughs> asks me, like, why did you start her listing? I'm like, cause that is my thing. Like when I'm not talking business, I'm in the shower, I'm shaving, yeah. I'm I'm cleansing, I'm scrubbing, I'm facialing. I'm that three hour shower girl. Oh and I'm like, goodness. this is gonna be my retirement thing. So yeah. I feel like this is gonna you, we're gonna be somewhere. Drinking matcha, doing facials yep. on the beach. Y'all gonna be at Soho House like, what kind of matcha is this? Yeah. Do you have the more matcha blend? Come on. Or Listen, so <laughs> another company hits the portfolio. Let's just call it a brand. <laughs> Let's just call it a brand. Humble. Just call it a brand. But you all, make sure you go follow my girl. If you heard this podcast or you saw her on the show, let her know. Go show her some love. And thank you guys for tuning in to... The Girl CEO Show, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this podcast to your friends. And if you watched it today and you got something from it, shoot me a text, 202-410-2903. Let me know what you got from this. What was the light bulb moment for you? What was your aha moment? Or what was that thing with that you heard and you were like, yes, this is it. Let me know. And until next time, keep being the Girl CEO that you are. Bye guys. Bye y'all. It's the girl CEO show. Run it up. Always on the grind. You already know what's up. Everything from day to the life in the business. Covering it all like a boss. Come and get this. It's the girl CEO show. Yeah.